ideas for topics for Dharma talks like this come from a lot of different places. Um, sometimes it's something I've, I've read, it's some you know, world event, current event sorts of things, my own personal experiences. Um, sometimes I just ask people, especially you know, other people here, members here, what would be helpful? You know, what's a question that they have or a topic, something to be interested in, some aspect of practice that they're struggling with, you know, something like that. So that's what I did this week. I went to uh, one of the members here. I asked what would be the most beneficial kind of personally for thing for me to talk about. And so here's the suggestion that I got. We struggle with maintaining our inner peace when confronted with painful or stressful external stimuli. How do we maintain our peace without suppressing or repressing anything? How do we know when we are allowing feelings to pass through us versus suppressing them? So. I started thinking about this. I'm working on the topic. I started drafting some thoughts out, and this I'm like, this is feeling familiar. Then you know, this is this is sounding, and then I realized I'd already talked about this. I've done a talk about this, almost this exact same question, the same topic. It's actually one of the first Dharma talks I ever gave um, in 2017 up at Muddy Water Temple in Michigan. I did, I, I dealt with the, basically the same thing. So I. I went back to that old talk. I'm like, let me pull that out. Let me clean that up and fix some things, and you know, make it a little, make a little more sense. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. Hopefully, it still works. Um, I'm going to start with the same two little pieces of scripture that I used before because I think they're so perfect. These are both selections from the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Pali Canon. So the first one is a little section from the. Salata Sutta, the dart. So these are the words of the Buddha. An untaught worldling, O oh monks, experiences pleasant feelings, he experiences painful feelings, and he experiences neutral feelings. A well-taught noble disciple likewise experiences pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings. Now what is the distinction, the diversity, the difference that exists herein between a well-taught noble disciple and an untaught worldling. When an untaught worldling is touched by a painful bodily feeling, he worries and grieves, he laments, he beats his breast, weeps and is distraught. He thus experiences two kinds of feelings, a bodily and a mental feeling. It is as if a man were pierced by a dart and following the first piercing he is hit by a second dart. So that person will experience feelings caused by two darts. It is similar with an untaught worldling. When touched by a painful bodily feeling, he worries and grieves, he laments, beats his breast, weeps and is distraught. So he experiences two kinds of feelings, a bodily one and a mental feeling. But in the case of a well-taught noble disciple, O oh monks, when he is touched by a painful feeling, he will not worry nor grieve or lament. He will not beat his breast and weep, nor will he be distraught. It is one kind of feeling he experiences, a bodily one, but not a mental feeling. It is as if a man were pierced by a dart, but, when hit, but was not hit by a second dart following the first one. So this person experiences feelings caused by a single dart only. It is similar with a well-taught noble disciple. When touched by a painful feeling, he will not worry nor grieve and lament. He will not beat his breast and weep, nor will he be distraught. He experiences one single feeling, a bodily one. This, O oh monks, is the distinction, the diversity, the difference that exists between a well-taught noble disciple and an untaught worldling. The second selection is from the Anatalakana Sutta, the discourse on the not-self characteristic. All feelings, whether it is of the present, past, or future, whether it is in oneself or in others, whether coarse or sublime, inferior or superior, far or near, should be seen with right understanding as it actually is. This is not mine. This is not I. This is not myself. Bhikkhus, how do you conceive it? Is a feeling permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Now is what is impermanent painful or pleasant? Painful, venerable sir. Now is what is impermanent, what is painful, since subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this is I, this is myself? No, venerable sir. 
So bhikkhus, any kind of feeling whatever, whether past, future, or presently arisen, whether gross or subtle, whether in oneself or external, whether inferior or superior, whether far or near, must be with right understanding how it is, be regarded thus. This is not mine. This is not I. This is not myself. Bhikkhus, when a noble follower who has heard the truth sees this, he finds estrangement in feeling. When he finds estrangement, passion fades out. With the fading of passion, he is liberated. When liberated, there is knowledge that he is liberated. He understands birth is exhausted. The holy life has been well lived out. What can be done is done. Of this, there is no more beyond. Those are the words of the Buddha. Strong emotions to events in our lives are, they're going to happen. They're inevitable. Uh, there's nothing in the Buddhist tradition that says otherwise. There's nothing that says we can or that we should try to turn ourselves into, you know, emotionless avatar, uh, automatons, uh, Star Trek Vulcans, pure logic without any feeling. That's not the goal. Sometimes people get that idea from a kind of a misinterpretation of what the Buddha meant. He taught that suffering is rooted in attachment. Right? But sometimes people take that too far. Right? Just don't care and then you won't feel. Right? That's not what the Buddha meant. That's not what the Buddha meant at all. Sometimes we get our whole identity tied up with our emotional states, negative ones in particular. It's really insidious. Some of us get wrapped up in the role of you know, the martyr, the long-suffering one, building our whole sense of self around perceived injustices and agonies. Some of us identify with our anxieties, and the fearful one, uh, meek, timid, scares of our own shadows, you know, like Piglet from the Winnie the Pooh stories. Some of us get wrapped up in our guilt and our shame, so wrapped up in that that our whole lives kind of become guilt and shame. Some of us build a whole persona around being angry, about around being resentful, and because of that, we, we let ourselves get away with being mean and spiteful. It's just who I am. It's my nature. Right. From a Buddhist point of view, um, this is, of course, very silly. <laughs> Violence, fear, shame, anger, depression, emotions can't be what we are fundamentally, our inherent nature, they can't be our inherent nature. In the Mahayana tradition, we talk about the Tathagatagarbha, the Buddha nature. That's the inherent nature of all sentient beings, the fundamental capacity that we have for compassion and wisdom, wise enlightenment. As the Japanese Zen master Hakuin taught in his song of Zazen, and I love this, all beings by nature are Buddha, as ice by nature is water. Apart from water, there is no ice. Apart from beings, no Buddha. Even our language kind of misleads us about emotions. I am afraid. As if somehow our fear has become identical with ourselves. I am angry like we have somehow transformed into anger, you know, kind of pure anger, nothing but anger, or worse still, you, you make me so angry, as if that other person has a, a magic wand that can wave, zoop, zoop, and suddenly, poof, you're transmogrified into just like a seething mass of anger. That's all that's left of you is just anger. The truth is that intense emotions are just like all our other experiences. They arise from causes and conditions. They come from the situations that we're in. They rise up, they fade away. We just chanted that, right, in the Heart Sutra, right? Emotion has no form. It's not permanent. It's not, it, it, there's nothing solid about it. Feelings are among the Lego blocks that we're made of. But they aren't us, they're only temporary, just like our thoughts. So we shouldn't get too wrapped up in them. We shouldn't take them too seriously because they're fleeting. Now, if we're mindful, we can 
feel that experience as it's happening. We can, we can analyze it. We can channel the energy that that emotional state brings along with it through our wisdom and our compassion, and we can, we can act accordingly. Right? We can act in a way that's wise and compassionate. It's when we're not mindful that the whole process turns into a kind of a reflex, right? Uh, we kind of jump straight from the, the trigger, right? Something happens in the world, something happens in the world around us, something happens in the situation that we're in, and that just sort of leads immediately to kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction, right? The emotional response, denigrating ourselves, lashing out at somebody else, uh, giving up hope, you know, whatever, whatever the emotional state of the moment happens to be. Uh, my wife's a huge tennis fan. She's a member of the United States Tennis Association. Uh, and they have a magazine that they say every couple of months we get this tennis magazine that comes to the house. And they regularly have columns in there about the mental game, right? Uh, and especially about not letting your emotions get the best of you. That's a common, common theme, right, as you're playing tennis. When I first read one such article, I, I thought it was making a really good point for me, but then I looked at it more carefully and I realized that it, it really wasn't. It was almost saying the exact opposite of what I'm talking about here. So I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of this, this particular article about tennis, uh, and I think you'll see why it's inconsistent with what the Buddha Dharma teaches. The most useful advice I can give for winning the mental game, mental struggle of competition is have no feeling at the ends of points. This is true whether you've just made a horrible error or a great shot, and it doesn't mean that you simply don't show disappointment or exuberance. It means that you don't have any emotional reaction, good or bad, to the outcome of points. You simply let the results of the last point pass you by. It isn't as difficult as it seems. Once you make up your mind not to react to the outcome of points, you'll find that you will keep your emotions in check. The decision to do it and the motivation to stick with it are the hardest part. You have to remain consciously determined to forego emotional reactions point by point. Tennis is an emotional game, and the urge to react after points is natural. If you don't suppress it, nature will take its course, and you will fluctuate emotionally throughout the match. Now, the danger word in that, the word in that that makes it very much not consistent with the Buddha Dharma is the word suppress, right? We're back to that Vulcan thing, right? Turn off your emotions. Don't feel, right? The solution to not allowing your emotions to overwhelm you is to just deactivate them somehow. Just turn them off. Don't feel anything. That's what the author, the article's author wrote, at least. I'm not, I'm not sure that's really what the article's author meant, though. Uh, what I suspect he was thinking about were those athletes, and there do seem to be a lot of them in tennis, who kind of wear their hearts on their sleeve so much that they uh, that 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 that, that, that um, their emotional state just dominates their performance, right? The public comes to identify them with their emotional outbursts. Oh, he's a choker, right? Uh, she's having another meltdown. As usual, he's throwing a tantrum over that line call, right? They don't just feel their emotions. They kind of wallow in them. You know, they wallow in their emotions. They overwhelm themselves. They allow themselves to kind of become their emotions. That's what the Buddha would call the second dart, right? The player hits a bad shot and feels disappointment. That's the first dart. Choking as a result and blowing the match that's the second dart, right? She loses a long rally point and is frustrated. That's the first dart. The next thing you know, she's in tears and screaming at her coach up in the stands. That's the second <coughs> dart. In fact, being mindful of the first dart, genuinely feeling it and being conscious of it is what can help you avoid the second dart. I, I don't know about you, my experience is that it's when I'm not paying enough attention to my emotions that they get the better of me. They kind of run away with me. 
If you're not mindful of the first feeling, it can quickly grow and spread. It's like an infection or a short circuit. Uh, in a sense, the second dart is a self-inflicted wound. It's the one you shoot at yourself. One of the problems that we often have with emotions is some, you know, sometimes they get out of control before we realize it. Uh, we may not be aware of how angry we're getting, for example, until we're seeing red and we can hear our pulse in our ears, right, because our heart's banging so hard. This is one of the benefits that establishing a regular meditation practice can have by meditating on the body, right? By using meditation to get in touch with our bodies, to really experience what our bodies feel like on the inside, we can become more attuned to the changes that happen in our bodies going through different kinds of situations and when different emotions are arising. Uh, in time, we can become more aware of kind of that, that initial little bubble, the initial sign of an emotional state in our bodies before they get so strong that they kind of run amok, right? They become unmanageable. Um, we'll realize that, you know, oh, my jaw is getting tight, right? My heart rate's ticked up a little bit. I'm, I'm, my hands are, you know, like clenching. I can, you know, I can feel that as it's first starting before it kind of gets out of hand before it becomes overwhelming. The Buddha taught about an idea what's called the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes, the sublime states. There's four of these. Loving kindness, Mitri, compassion, Karuna, empathetic joy, Mudita, equanimity, Upeksha. The last of those four, obviously, is the most relevant at the moment, right? Equanimity. Upeksha refers to an, an evenness of mind, right? Uh, a state of emotional balance. It doesn't mean a state without emotions at all. Obviously not. I mean, if you think about that list, the first three things on that list are emotions. They're altruistic emotions. Right? They're emotions that are motivated by a concern for the well-being of others, of all sentient beings. They're not selfish emotions. They're altruistic emotions, but they're still emotions. Love, compassion, joy. Those are emotions. In fact, if you think about the, the metaphor of balance, it becomes clear why we need to feel what we feel or we don't have any hope of establishing a, a state of equanimity. If you think about, you're doing some physical activity, right? And you start to lose your balance, but you're not paying enough attention. And as a result of that, you just keep tipping that way and you fall over, right? But if you're mindful, you feel that initial shift. You realize it's happening and you can react skillfully to restore your balance. So the same thing applies to our emotions, right? If we're not paying enough attention, we just fall into that emotional state. But if we're mindful of our emotions, when we start to go in a direction that may not be healthy, we're aware of it. And then we can manage it. We can reestablish our balance. We can reestablish our equanimity. So if you're mindful, you feel that first start. Ah, that's fear. There's a little fear, a little anxiety there. Okay, that's anger. I felt, I feel a little bit, feel that anger coming up. And then you can react skillfully, right? To keep your mind from tipping all the way into that direction, throwing you further out of balance emotionally. And that's the way you avoid the second dart, right? By keeping into that state of equanimity. So feel what you feel, right? Don't hide from it. Don't bury it. Feel it. Know you're feeling it. Just don't become it. Right? Don't identify with it. We're, we're human. The first dart, not a damn thing we can do about it. Right? Stuff's going to happen. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about that part. The second dart, though, the self-inflicted one, that one we can manage. Right? But we can avoid with mindfulness and skill, we can manage that one. Our dedicated, consistent practice of the Buddha Dharma can help us develop the skills that can help us to manage that sort of thing. 
Sangbala, Shipshio, may you I and all beings manifest enlightenment.